Hey. Okay, so I know uh, a lot of you people work a lot with notebooks, which is good, but as you probably know, the work can be completely frustrating and monotonous and just crappy before you get a result. So here's an example of, I hate standing still. Here's an example of what you need to do to create that ugly 1980s bitmap thing in the middle. So import a bunch of libraries. Um, we're going to use matplotlib here. Use some obscure style to find your figure, your, your axes, and all that stuff, and then set all your colors. And you probably don't just write this code. You probably take hours to figure out exactly what you want. And this is probably the simple version of hours or days worth of work. And at the end of it, you get this thing, which is, you know, not really, <laughs> not really bootstrap type well, like 2017 web design. So wouldn't this be nicer? So Pixie Dust is an extension um, mainly written by a colleague of mine, another developer advocate in my group. And I just implemented the mapping part. He did all the tough part about re reverse engineering Jupyter Notebooks and figuring out how to write new Python code in the sort of inside the kernel and extend it in amazing ways. So with Pixie Dust, you get one command, display, and it takes your data frame, uh, either Spark data frame or Pandas data frame, and gives you a GUI to work with it. You can make it a table. You can do bar charts and line charts and scatter plots and histograms. And uh, adding support to stash it to different databases that we support, our favorite IBM databases on the cloud. And uh, also do mapping. And that's the focus of what I'm going to talk about. So how many people do mapping on a daily basis, geospatial work? Just a few. Good. So that was part of the reason, um, you know, you can do, obviously, when you're going to do really high-end stuff, you're going to get in and customize it yourself, and you're going to want the control you get with a lot of code, or the, the kind of control you can only get with coding it yourself. But if you're kind of new to it, and you just want, you know, you have a latitude and longitude field in your data, you want to see what it looks like, or you want to do a lot of exploratory data analysis before you spend all that time on your final product, uh, the Pixie Dust extension p can be a great way to just play around before you devote a lot of time to um, the custom code-based work. And that applies to the charting, the bar charting, and the line charting as well. So, you know, I think of Pixie Dust as a tool to sort of um, give you just as much or devote just as much time as you want to at the right stage of the pro project. So at the beginning, of a, beginning of, the beginning of a project, when you just want to sort of um, get a feel for your data, look at a few things, you don't want to have to stop, switch context, and go and read books for three hours and figuring out like all the, uh, all the options in the PLT command, right? You want to sort of play with your data. You want to be focused on your subject matter and understanding that. And then when you get you know, overlapping text in, on, your, on your graphs and you want to fix that and really make that nice, you can do, save that all to the end. When you're, when you're just thinking and brainstorming, you want some easy to use tool. And this looks pretty good, eh? actually, right out of the box. So I'm going to talk a little bit. So that's the problem. I think this is a great solution to that. Um, it's an open, Pixie Dust is an open source extension. We're looking for lots of help with making it better. And you don't have to run it on IBM Cloud. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. It can just run on its own in Jupyter. You can download Jupyter Notebooks, set everything up yourself, and uh, go yourself and use it. But let me talk a little bit about what we do. So I'm, in, I'm a developer advocate for the Watson Data Platform, which is a combination. We used, last year, we were Cloud Data Services. Uh, we're responsible for all the online databases, managed databases that IBM offers, uh, DB2 on cloud and Cloudint, great NoSQL database and DashDB, column data store, things like that. And this year we kind of merged with Cloud and Watson a little bit, and our responsibility is more, now it's more than databases and analytics, and we're talking more about some of the cognitive stuff from Watson. But the, 
you can't really read this back there, but the core pieces of what we do are data engineering, data science, um, analysis, and app development. We try to bring those all together, so eliminate a lot of the friction of starting, of doing all that stuff yourself and have it all in one, in one managed service offering. So, you know, that's the whole big picture. And then we have data services that we're adding, like we bought the weather company last year, and, uh, you know, making it, as big companies do, a one-stop shop. But today I'm just going to talk about data science, really. And the flagship offering there is, uh, oh, forgot to do my animations. So yeah, we got a lot of weather data from buying Weather Company and Twitter partnership and adding Watson machine learning stuff and Geo is my specialty. So um, data science, our main offering, flagship offering in data science is called the data science experience, not very creative. Um, and we call it DSX. But all DSX really is, is a real convenience tool. It combines, gives you a web-based interface to a Jupyter notebook, and it fires up Spark instances automatically, along with uh, object storage, which is kind of like uh, Amazon S3. So as soon as you start up a project in DSX, you have Spark, uh, place to store files, and a Jupyter notebook environment running right away, which is a really nice thing if you're, well, you, most of you sounds like you probably have set that up on your own and uh, that can be no fun. So, so for those of you who don't know much about notebooks, oh, I should just talk about it. So a Jupyter Notebook is uh, not just a coding environment, but it's also a place where you can combine code with markdown text and uh, interactive HTML to really create a final presentation product around around your data engineering and data science work. Started off, the idea started off, you know, hundreds of years ago. Scientists have been documenting their work for a long time and they'd write in notebooks. That's where the name came from. So you'd have all these scientific notebooks where people are writing down their experimental results and, write, and drawing little graphs and things like that. And then, I forget, who invented MATLAB? <laughs> Carl, I can't remember this name, but this is amazing guy we uh, owe a lot to. MATLAB took the idea of this sort of analog notebooks and brought it into the digital world back in maybe the 80s, but I think the 90s. And the MATLAB notebook is really the, probably the direct heritage of Jupyter notebooks. You could do a lot of coding in there and get, you know, results right away in a, in a graph and a visualization and put in pictures and helper things. And uh, MATLAB is still an amazing product. And so out of that grew a whole sort of family of data science notebook types. There's not just Jupyter, there's uh, Zeppelin and some other things. But <clears throat> since we, since our company is um, focused on supporting Jupyter, that's what we built Pixie Dust for. And I'm talking about visualizations, and particularly map visualization, but there are a lot of other pieces to Pixie Dust which make your Jupyter Notebook work um, a little bit more pleasant. Package Manager, you can import, well, I'm going to talk about all these very quickly because I'm already almost halfway through. Package Management, Visualization, Cloud Integration, a Scala Bridge, which is really cool. Uh, extensibility, Embedded Apps. So the Package Manager you can install Spark packages or jars without modifying a config file. Just if you do that, that's really nice. One simple API for display, which I'm going to talk more about. Um, data export into files, CSV, JSON, XML, or your favorite online cloud IBM database. Scala Bridge, if you use this, I don't do Scala, so I don't know how amazing this is, but I hear that sharing variables between Python and Scala, you know, if you want to use a library really good Scala library, but you're working in Python, you can go back and forth as an amazing feature. I tried to make this animate quickly so I could go through it quickly. Um, extensibility with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And embedded apps. So this is something we're building, so we're still building this out right now. So once you're able to sort of programmatically control your data frame, and build some of these graphics. 
why not construct an app? Why not really take advantage of the DOM and build out a whole, uh, basically a whole web, web application within your Jupyter Notebook, which is fed live from dynamic data from data frames. It's all based on the fact that you have these data frames, these objects, variable objects um, stored in your Jupyter Notebook that can be exposed and operated on computationally and um, then rendered with anything you can do in HTML, JavaScript, CSS. CSS. So now I'm going to switch to a demo. Let's hope everything works well. Uh, sorry, this is a little bit blurry in the background. So this is the data science experience. And you'll see it's not very, the fact that it's Jupiter isn't hidden very much. Everything below here is pretty much like the Jupyter Notebook you'll see on your desktop. So I'm just going to, I have some code here. Uh, you can install it from PyPy, so I commented out pip install pixie dust. Import pixie dust. So we bring in this library. So we've got two mapping libraries in here, Google Maps and uh, Mapbox. And that's what I'm going to talk about mainly. So Google Maps has a nice little developer API for letting you make maps based on named, named fields. So let's say you have a bunch of international data and you have country names and you have values in another field. That's what Google Maps is good at. Or you have um, US data and you have state or county names and you have values you want to map. Um, that's what Google Maps is good at. Mapbox is better at mapping data with geographic coordinates. Oop, so I forgot to talk a little bit about this. So the first thing we do, we import Pixie Dust. We run the Pixie Dust comes with a few sample data sets built in, which I'm going to take advantage of. So if you run the sample data command with no, no parameter, it returns a list showing you the data sets available. I'm going to grab the total population by country data set from the UN or from the World Bank that I have in here. And that was number three. So I run sample data again with the value of three. It creates a Spark data frame. And then I run the display command with the data frame as the single parameter. And you'll see this sweet looking map with no code. And not just a map, but as you hover over it, pops up, pops up the name of the, um, the field name and the value. In this case, this is a nice example. Obviously, I use good sample data, so you pop up the uh, name of the country and the population value, which you probably can't see back there. And as you move over here, you'll see this little pointer changes down here, too. This is all, this isn't us. This is all directly from uh, the Google Maps API. So all we're really doing here is feeding the Google Maps JavaScript library, which is all in this cell, uh, with the data frame. And I'll show you, so if you go in here, there are options here. I could have given the map a title. So global population. And this is where I picked out my fields. This is a lot more fun than writing code. So you can just drag and drop these guys here. <clears throat> and um, here's an important thing. So you can choose what sampling of your data to use. So here I'm going to choose that I'm, uh, all this has to happen in memory, so you don't want to use a terabyte of data in your browser. So you can pick the number of rows to display. Prob I'm using 1,000 right now, which covers all the countries in the world. So that, that actually grabs all the data. But if you had millions of records, you know that you were guaranteed to only get back 1,000 um, in your browser in memory. And you could up that to 10,000, which would probably be fine. But I know this works for this. And one thing to note about that, it's not <clears throat> the number of rows that are going to come back are not 
the number of rows in your data set, but it's the number of rows after you do this aggregation command of some count or something like that. So you can actually operate on the whole data set and <clears throat> as long as you know that less than this amount of rows is going to be the result. So that's cool, but you know, if you're doing real work, you probably have um, data with latitudes and longitudes in it. So I'm gonna, I just pulled down a few months worth of home sales data from Redfin one day and use that to build a, another sample data set we put in here. So I'm gonna pull that into a Spark data frame really quick. And I'm gonna run this uh, display command again. How much time do I have? Okay. And ooh, we get a nice. So Pixie Dust fires up the, uh, or <clears throat> grabs the Mapbox client side JavaScript library, takes all the data, transforms it into GeoJSON as you heard Mike Bostock talk a little bit about, because um, uh, D3 uses GeoJSON as a spatial data format. So does Mapbox's client-side library. Translates it into GeoJSON, adds some basic um, styling, styling, thematic styling, um, cart cartographic, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's a JSON file that describes how to cartographically style the uh, points. And then it also uses Mapbox to pull in this base street layer underneath for some context. So instead of just getting a map with your data back, you actually get all the streets for free. So these are, so it's, it's doing a little bit of deconfliction for, to give you a clean map and it's clustering points if they overlap. So as you move out, you'll see uh, all these numbers are how many points are clustered there. But as you zoom in, you'll get individual points, and then you can see the price of the home sale. So these are all home sales over a million dollars in northeastern Massachusetts in a f over a few month period. So you can start to see patterns. What you can also do here, we have a few options. You can just see, um, just see all the points, not thematically. Just hover over, get the values. I showed you that choropleth map, which is thematic, or you can do a heat map, more of a heat map style, so that spatial patterns jump out <clears throat> more visibly. And that's all defined. All you have to do is have a latitude and a longitude field in your data. You drag those over here, and then you put some numeric field as your value to, to style on. And just like anything else, you get some, you get aggregation there. Oh, forgot to show you. So you'll need a free, you'll need a free um, access token from Mapbox to make this work. You can get that on their website. The, the help button explains all that. But let me just quickly show you. So in addition to the mapping, which is sort of the most complex thing, you can just click on the table button and see the data as a table, and you can go back and forth. So here's a nice, if you've ever used notebooks, the tabular output is kind of crappy. So this is a much nicer way to see your data in a table, and then you can go in here, and the idea is that at any point in time, you might want to see your data as any one of these types of visualizations. I don't think this one will make sense, really. Yeah. <laughs> but it's kind of fun to play with this. You see, like, the relationship between home price and number of bathrooms, things like that. I'll go back to the map. So that is the demo, and it all worked. Excellent. So for programmers who would like to court your participation on the project, um, as I mentioned earlier, this all works off, all the renderers, we're calling all these different visualization styles renderers. 
they all work off of a Spark data frame, which is exposed to the code. And in my case, in mapping, I need to translate that Spark data frame into GeoJSON because that's sort of the lingua franca of uh, web-based mapping. And I know um, if you chose a thematic choropleth style map, you need to quickly generate five quantiles. Uh, I just chose that because that's the most common thing. You do that, which is obviously a really easy thing for, for uh, Python to do. And then we, so the data is in GeoJSON. The styling, the cartographic styling is in another style, type of JSON file. We create that. And then we combine it all into a Jinja2 template. So Pixie Dust adopted Jinja2 as a templating engine, so you can use variables. You don't just have to spit out HTML. You can um, reference variables from your Python code within the HTML to bring data. And, and then we show it all in the output of a notebook cell. And the magic of notebook cells is that you can embed any HTML, JavaScript, and CSS inside them. So you can do amazing things. You can take that as far as you want, and we're pushing it pretty much as hard as you can. Uh, in our case, only for the mapping, for some reason, Mapbox's uh, library doesn't like being embedded in a div, so you have to, had to put it in an iframe. But that, uh, so that happens, so we have an iframe that gets shown before we embed the mapview.html inside that iframe. And then we just, as I mentioned before, we call the base mapping service from Mapbox to show a really pretty uh, street map underneath. So the future of this particular part of Pixie Dust is probably adding more support for other companies, maybe uh, Esri support for mapping, if you want to, in addition to the Mapbox and Google. Uh, right now, we're just doing points. It would be nice to support polygons. And do have more cartographic visualization options, like a lot of data, not a, a lot of natural occurring data, like weather patterns or hurricanes or sort of erosion. Erosion likelihood is more suited to a sort of a, a hex bin type view rather than a rather than a hard line view. Points, points, lines, and polygons are really meant for man-made features, not really environmental things like rainfall patterns and, and things like that. So having some support for continuously changing data um, visualizations is, is uh, in the future. And then animated visualization. So if you want to model, if you want to see plume dispersion, um, that's something pretty big now with all the, with all the things happening in subways and, or you know, flooding, uh, the way water disperses across a surface. Those are the kind of things, those are the kind of scientific areas you'd want an animated um, spatiotemporal visualization. And that's, uh, that's a lot harder than what's happened so far, so please help. And that's what I've got. So go out and use Pixie Dust, install it, try out data science, um, data science experience, or try it on your own in your local notebooks. And let me know how you like it or if you want to get started helping us um, write some code. Thanks.